Welcome to the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair's week of podcasts featuring local, national, and international activists and authors. Due to the ongoing global pandemic, the Book Fair Collective decided to move their event online again this year. So for the second year in a row, From Embers is teaming up with the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair to release presentations over our podcast platform. Recordings of these Voices of Resistance were conducted on unceded Indigenous territories across so-called British Columbia and beyond. For more information about the book fair and a full schedule of online events this week, check out victoriaanarchistbookfair.ca and listeners in the Victoria area are encouraged to visit Camus Books at 2620 Quadra Street or online at camus.ca for anarchist publications and more. And to find out more about our regular anarchist podcast, go to fromembers.libsyn.com or simply search From Embers in your favorite podcast app. The Victoria Anarchist Book Fair Collective would like to acknowledge the interview you are about to hear took place uh, simultaneously on unceded uh, Wishanic and Lekwungen territories in so-called Victoria, Canada, and on the traditional territories of the Ganake Haga peoples in Chio Chage, historically known as the gathering place for many First Nations, what is now called Montreal, Quebec. My name is Rob Rao. Today I am interviewing Stefan Christophe, a community organizer, writer, and musician in Chio Chage, Montreal, a longtime community, uh, community radio host on CKUT 90.3 FM and who produces the program Free City Radio that explores the intersections between the arts and social activism. As a community organizer, Stefan is on the board of the Immigrants Workers Center in the city and has been deeply involved in migrant justice movements over the last two decades. In activism, Stefan has worked to explore the intersections between struggles for justice locally and globally, working towards the mobilization of the anti corporate globalization movement in Quebec City in 2001 to oppose the now defeated free trade of the Americas agreement and also the World Trade Organization ministerial meeting in Montreal in 2003. Safan has a long-standing connection to anti-colonial struggles of Indigenous communities, having spent time on the front lines with Indigenous land defenders in the Algonquin community of Grassineros, the Mohawk communities of Ganesatake, as well as with the Sequenquam people fighting colonial land ex- expropriation by the Canadian colonial state. Safan has also been a longtime organizer with the boy, uh, global boycott of divestment and sanctions movement in support of Palestinian glo- liberation globally. So welcome, Stefan. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for um, uh, sharing this conversation uh, today. Yeah, um, you're welcome. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, let's, uh, so I guess um, since the topic of the, the talk uh, today, this hour is um, examples of cultural, maybe, uh, yeah, we just uh, start talking about uh, examples of cultural resistance and the intersection of art and activism. And maybe we'll start with uh, Quebec City in 2001, uh, the FTAA, um, which uh, we just had the 20 year anniversary in April. Um, and, um, yeah, maybe, uh, tell you, uh, you mentioned it's your first major involvement in organizing and activism. So maybe, uh, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, in April, 2001, tens of thousands of people gathered in Quebec city to protest the free trade area of the Americas, uh, trade agreement, but that was also taking place, um, as part of a wider, um, series of demonstrations across the Americas that, Um, expanded uh, over a couple of years. There were mobilizations also against the FTAA in cities like Quito and Ecuador. Um, The protests in Quebec City took place as part of this hemispheric network of opposition to the trade agreement. Now, today, trade agreements are less in focus within the context of grassroots activist networks and anarchist organizing. Um, I think it's important to recall why people gathered to protest the FTAA. Um, 
as a corporate agreement, it worked uh, to try to solidify a trade regime across the Americas that basically was driving uh, the commodification of the environment. In its essence, uh, it's a colonial trade agreement. It's rooted in the same economic um, and political policies of expansionism that led to the conquest of indigenous territories across the hemisphere. I think making that connection to contemporary trade uh, frameworks and histories of colonization is important. That was part of the focus of the mobilization um, that I was part of. As a member of the anti-capitalist convergence um, in Montreal, CLAC, also, I uh, helped facilitate a number of actions uh, and events um, around um, creating space for artistic explorations and expression uh, of opposition to the FTAA. So that also um, led to an event that I coordinated called Free Verses of the Americas, where I uh, invited poets from different um, cities uh, who were going to be in Quebec City for <laughs> the uh, protests to be there and to read their work. Uh, in, in fact, the um, venue where we were going to have the um, poetry reading uh, on the night of um, April 20th, uh, 2001, was closed because of the mass amounts of tear gas that were uh, covering Quebec City uh, due to... Um, the violent actions of the Sécurité de Québec and other police forces of both the Quebec state and Canadian state that were present. Uh, but we did some readings outside um, on the sidewalk. Uh, and that was also part of a whole evening of expression uh, where like thousands of people gathered with sticks and rocks and made rhythms on the overpass highway just below the point of protest at uh, downtown Quebec city. So it was really like a very moving moment. Um, you know, I was 19 years old at the time and, you know, it was a transformative experience to see tens of thousands of people um, coming together in also a way that created space for um, a diversity of different groups and organizations to be present um, anarchist collectives media collectives, arts collectives, um, you know, of course, there was more like institutional opposition to the FTA also by, you know, trade unions and environmental NGOs. But I do think that it was really important that there was a space for also non-institutional grassroots networks um, that involved people like me to participate in this protest also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, there as well. And I, I remember, it, I feel like it was sort of a anti-capitalist generational Woodstock in a way where it was really a, a coming of age for a lot of a lot of us who were of the in their kind of early 20s or <laughs> late teens or so in, in the uh, in the um, in the early 2000s. Definitely. Uh, yeah, it was a collective space that that really was an experience that uh, we all shared in, and informed our our politics and our sense of possibilities. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah, it did help shape the sense of possibility politically for a lot of people. I, I totally feel what you're saying on that, Rob. Mm -hmm. And I guess that does uh, segue into like very well what ha what happened only a few months later with uh, 9/11, and then the pivot uh, of that movement uh, to a kind of anti-war. Act and um, and uh, maybe yeah to, to describe your role there and uh, what came after and I guess maybe if there's uh, art uh, how how you used art and music in in that context sure I mean I think that there was you know the emergency of nine eleven that took place and you know we really um, had to respond to this mobilization for war and invasion that was taking place. Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, which persists uh, until now, uh, and the consequences of this militarized response to 9-11, uh, we are facing until today, globally, uh, as we see in Afghanistan, and the persisting refugee crisis uh, that is directly a result of policies of uh, militarism that uh, responded to 9-11. 
um, which the Canadian government uh, under Jean Chrétien at the time definitely directly participated in. So I think it's important to underline that, um, that Canada did participate overtly uh, in the invasion of uh, Afghanistan, which today uh, continues to have major ramifications. And I think that um, the protests and the movement against war at that time, uh, we felt in you know grassroots networks that it was really important to respond to the moment uh, and also to see the ways that the state was utilizing um, the context of the quote unquote war on terror to crack down on gra- grassroots activism, you know, to try to criminalize um, voices of opposition and grassroots non-institutional networks of action. Um, and so security laws uh, were signed and uh, enforced that uh, basically were labeled anti-terror legislation, but in fact created a whole new world of these um, intersectional sort of tools of repression. Um, So they're using the legal system, they're using the political justification of the war on terror, in quotes. They're using, um, you know, a whole framework of repression and uh, exploiting the victims of 9-11. Because, you know, I think that for me, it was really transformative to be in New York City Um, in October, November of 2001. And I was with uh, Seth Tabachman, uh, who's an anarchist um, street artist in New York. And we actually visited the site of the uh, event, uh, the the former World Trade Center. And he was doing drawings at the time of the location. And also I participated in anti-war protests um, at the time in New York. And I remember a a pamphlet that he made, which said, our grief is not a cry for war. And I think it's really important to recognize also like the ways that working class people, particularly working class immigrants, were directly impacted by 9-11, particularly the Puerto Rican community. There was um, a um, business that operated in one of the trade towers uh, called Windows on the World, which was um, largely employing uh, working class uh, people and um, people from the surrounding boroughs in New York. So the East Village, uh, where you have a lot of housing projects, a lot of Puerto Ricans were working at uh, the time uh, in that company, cleaning the windows of these uh, elite office buildings. And um, they would get dispatched from one of the trade center towers. And then the dispatch time was the morning. So that's when the 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 planes hit. So a lot of people died. And, you know, I was able to attend actually some events to commemorate those immigrant workers, um, uh, New Ricans also, you know, um, from, from the city who uh, died. Um, so I think like that sort of North American wide activist network um, that was, you know, around the anti-globalization protest was also deeply important for the anti-war movement and to try to understand that uh, our opposition to the war was not just like a moment of uh, opposition to uh, military response, but it was also trying to understand this event within the whole context of intersectional um, systems of violence that led us to that point. The way the victims of 9-11 were basically exploited by the Republican administration in the U S the way that Canada used the shock of nine 11 to justify their involvement in the invasion of Afghanistan. And, you know, we can look at many other directions, but I think all in all um, we still have not uh, recognized publicly the inherent injustice and violence of Canada's participation, the Canadian state's role in the war on terror. And, you know, so at the time I was, uh, you know, involved in a lot of street art, making a lot of banners for these demonstrations, uh, working with artists like Seth Tabachman, also putting up the work of artists like Eric Drucker. Uh, I was between Montreal and New York a lot at that time. 
And so for me, it was a very formative event, both joining the anti-war movement, but also seeing the way that on a human level, 9-11 did impact communities in New York. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm curious as to how you feel the, um, the street art of the time, uh, like using uh, Eric Joker's and uh, Seth's uh, Tabachman's art, how that communicated, um, yeah, I guess speaking to that, that sense of all, all um, possibility and that, the, the, like that slogan that Seth uh, used of our, our grief uh, is not a, a cry for war, like how, whether that, that managed to get that sentiment um, uh, out there, like bypassing the mainstream media and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's really great point to bring up, Rob, because I think, you know, one of the challenges for um, a moment like that is how to sort of summarize, you know, a huge critique that is urgent, that is important, um, without, you know, uh, disrespecting, you know, if we're in the New York City context, the experience of um, communities impacted by 9-11. So I think like having banners and and posters that said our grief is not a cry for war was a really meaningful way to say both we are opposed to war and that's, that's important, but also we recognize the impact. And I think in general, art does create space to really, you know, in its best moments, street art banners, the, the presence of art on flyers that we distribute in the cities um, really creates uh, a way to communicate these very complicated moments um, through, you know, a very clear and beautiful message at times. It's, it's, it's difficult to do it right, but I think when it does happen, uh, it has a huge impact and, you know, a different impact than, you know, um, academic articles or, um, you know, um, interventions within newspapers. Those are important too, but I think that there's a particularly important and unique role that art plays in those moments when, when people are looking for, um, you know, answers, when people are looking to sort of find an expression or work that speaks to how they're feeling also at a time like that. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested in in your your work more recently with the with the street stencils and stuff. I guess maybe it, is it it's in the context of um, Palestinian solidarity or and um, and other struggles and and uh, yeah, maybe because I guess it's it it continues that um, uh, that lineage or that line of 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 of, of speaking to uh, global um context of global struggles but uh, acting locally and and something very locally sure i mean street art is very tangible and um you know i've continued to do street art i was out last night pasting um you know for 20 years now and i learned how to make wheat paste and go out on the streets from people like seth the bachman um and, you know, within the context of, you know, organizing around the anti-capitalist convergence in Montreal, um, you know, it took me a while to find a really good wheat paste recipe. <laughs> uh, you know, the internet was different at that time. Um, but I experimented, you know, first I was trying, you know, to use wallpaper paste. Then I tried with glue. Then I tried boiling glue. And, and you know, and I, I remember at the time, nobody could really tell me exactly how it worked. And then when I went to New York City, then I found people really knew what they were doing with wheat paste. And that really helped me. <laughs> That's, I, I, I did do it for a company here in town. And it seemed it was really simple. It's just starch and a certain like it's just getting the water and starch proportions. Right. And yeah. So like, I, I, the two ingredients. <laughs> yeah. So I use bleached flour i would never okay. use it for anything i eat <laughs> but um you know shout out to west coast sensibilities on the food um but uh, um i use about one part to six uh, f uh bleach flour to boiling water and right. i think that that's really the key a lot of people don't know that it's not just warm water you have to have the water boiling because it activates the starch somehow. And then I, I use a whisk 
um, to whisk it as it's boiling. Um, like I pour the boiling water into the flour and I whisk it at the same time. Um, uh, so that's like basically the, the, the recipe I use. Um, and, uh, it doesn't taste very good with sugar and cinnamon. Um, (laughs) but, uh, I've tried it once. Um, I was really like really hungry in the context of some major action I can't remember. And I had no cash. So I, I made wheat paste and then, and then ate some of it and then went postering harsh. That that sounds um, very punk. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Um, so, um, yeah, I think today I continue to do street art because um, it's a way for me to connect with different artists, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of my intervention in the street art world is public also, and I make a point of that because I don't think it's cool to criminalize street art. Um, you know, I'm more on the wheat pasting, postering front. Uh, stenciling and and painting is not as much my thing, but I, I'd say it's part of the broader, you know, network of using the street as a um, uh, uh, venue to express these movements. So I do a lot of pasting uh, around the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in support of Palestinian human rights. I've also been posting a lot recently some designs that different artists I work with like Loki Studios or La, La Presse Chat Perdu. Also, um, I have an ongoing collaboration with a bunch of activists who are doing support for uh, the Wet'suwet'en uh, community, uh, the indigenous struggle against coastal gas link pipeline, uh, McGill University here in Montreal invests over $4 million in that pipeline So uh, through their endowments. So we have some street art that speaks to that. Um, so basically, I find that street art is a way to talk about these issues. Um, it's, again, not the only way, but it's, a, it's an active practice that I have in the city. And it's also like, a, I think, a tangible um, non-institutional way that people can plug in. I think that, you know, at least for somebody like me, um, you know, really coming from a totally non-institutional context, street art was a way for me to have a path or um, a space to participate in these moments and movements that I felt were really important. Um, so, yeah, so it continues actively, you know, I'll be going two times this week out on the streets. I've, you know, wheat pasted all over the world and Beirut and Paris and New York city, uh, you know, and it's always been, uh, you know, a part of my relationship to urban spaces. Yeah. That's what I find interesting about it too, is, is that way that it, um, it can transform a space or, or, um, um, yeah, bring a different dimension to a space. And um, I think you've also mentioned previously like that, it um, a way of kind of resisting gentrification and, and um, kind of, uh, I guess also contributing to that kind of reimagining of the city. Um, And uh, definitely. And I think that's really important, right? Like I think, you know, graffiti and tags also like if we're talking about like condos and making sure that uh the whole like expansion of condos and gentrification and 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 cities is opposed I, that's one important way to oppose that um and uh you know i think that it's important that that opposition to that sort of institutional structural violence is expressed also on the streets in that way the institutional structural violence of gentrification and, and mass condo development that excludes so many people in so many communities. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, maybe uh, we talk maybe a little bit about, uh, I was uh, interested in your um, work with uh, artists against apartheid and, and, and I guess maybe more generally about creating networks uh, between artists and musicians and activists. And um, I guess, yeah, maybe even speaking, you kind of, I guess, alluded to that, I think with street art as well, there's maybe uh, people engaged in it who consider themselves 
artists are, are doing it more for expression. And then um, the people who are trying to get a message across or trying to make change and, and maybe, yeah, maybe uh, talk about your experiences or reflections on, on trying to merge uh, those two worlds in both in music and uh, maybe also in, um, on the street. <laughs> Sure, sure. I mean, I I work with a lot of musicians. I look work with a lot of visual artists and designers um, all around the world. I'm very close with the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. I collaborate with a lot of members of that network um, in different places. Um, you know, we did a project together called Imaging Apartheid, um, which is a series of prints designed by artists around the world. Uh, in support of Palestinian liberation. I also contributed to the People's History poster series. Uh, I worked on a print uh, about actually the Quebec City mobilization. Um, so, yeah, I do contribute and collaborate with a lot of artists um, and these networks. But I also like try to find ways that um, we can create um, not just street art, but other like artistic expression that, um, you know, on the music front that I think is more about um, the spiritual side of organizing and action. You know, I've been basically most of my adult life has been revolving around this process of activism and grassroots organizing. So, you know, to sustain that for a long period of time is very challenging. Um, and, um you know, given that the, A, these networks are criminalized in different ways. And, you know, I'm not saying that to um, uh, compare or contrast with other parts of the world. Obviously, the mechanisms of state repression in different places are different. That's often racialized. Uh, the systems of violence are deployed differently. Um, but I do think that in that context and acknowledging the sort of uh, the racialized systems of violence at play uh, in a, the colonial state of Canada, it is important to acknowledge that um, grassroots activists, anarchist networks uh, are not liked by the government. <laughs> and so I think, you know, trying to sustain an active collaboration and participation in that process, you know, while at the same time, being part of migrant justice networks and being part of efforts to support indigenous sovereignty for such a long time is not easy. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's very challenging. And so for me, like getting more involved in music and playing music, that's mostly instrumental was a space to sort of have a spiritual practice that, um, you know, I've linked um, to my activism, but it's also, you know, there's, there's a lot, uh, to be said about activism, but there's also a lot to feel. <laughs> and there's a lot of sort of um, the sort of side of, of why we're involved in these moments and these movements that is difficult to express in words. Uh, and also sometimes, you know, the difficulties that uh, sustaining activism for a long time, um, the difficulties that is involved on that, front personally is also hard to put into words right um and so for me music has always been important you know and like a lot of uh you know friends of mine in montreal like you know the band godspeed you black emperor and you know mm -hmm. different projects like that i think for me i always saw them as um you know like sort of um fellow travelers in a way you know and um it's a band, you know, or, you know, the music that I do is instrumental. You know, I have a project called Rev Sonar, um, you know, Sonic Dreams, and it's not really overtly about a specific issue, but, you know, it's more about my uh, communication of, you know, as a, as a being trying to be here and be committed and be involved in these things. Um, Cause you know, a lot of the frameworks of how we understand the world aren't shaped by the ideas that um, critique capitalism, that critique colonialism, that critique environmental destruction, destruction and, and see the whole like trajectory of history as, as connected, right? Like a lot of the mainstreaming of like, um, you know, like 
thinking about Canadian state as a genocidal project of colonialism, you know, that's shifted in recent years, but it's something that, you know, we as activists have been talking, I mean, I've been talking about that with the networks I'm part of my entire adult life, right? So it's great to see it mainstreaming, but I do think that there's a danger in this moment because it's like, uh, great to see the discussion expanding and it's great and amazing to see like indigenous voices being lifted up, but how is that going to be translated and not come into real tangible change and not commodified also, you know, it's like something that I think about, you know, and, um, there's spiritual dimensions to that in the sense that, um, I think that, you know, the, the society that we live in can very, quickly sort of create like individualized responses to these moments, to these movements. And I think what is important about like decentralized networks and, you know, grassroots activism is that it reminds us of our collectivity and the ways that ideas develop together, not in isolation, not in silos. There, it's, you know, I think social media can really like push us towards sort of the great person theory as opposed to, you know, thinking about the ways that our ideas develop and share um, and exchange and conflict and contrast over time. You know, that's how most of my political education has happened. So there's a lot there, um, but that's my response. Yeah, yeah. And that makes me think about, yeah, if I think well, there's an obvious uh, connection in my mind as well to how to um how community is created. And, and I think, yeah, like what, uh, part of what you're saying about the spiritual, uh, and, uh, I guess even rejuvenating, uh, aspect of, of music and art is that, um, is that it's it, that the social dimension and, and, um, which is what it has in common with activism. Although I guess in creating music, you're, you're connecting with others, in a way that's um, that 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 is kind of almost like the basis, or is is uh, is um, is 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 creating community. That yeah, it's a very social art. Right on, right on. I feel that. Yeah. Um, I don't have too many more questions. <laughs> so that's great. Well, it's been great to talk with you. Thanks mm-hmm. so much for yeah. the exchange and. Um, to um, speak with you, Rob, was a great pleasure. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time, Stefan. The Anarchist Radio Berlin. From across the pond. It's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish and German. And please, don't mention the war. You can find us at channelzero-network.com and aradio-berlin.org.